Good evening and welcome to our book talk. We're going to wait just a, a few moments until uh, more people are able to come in. Hello and welcome to uh, this evening's book talk for the Center for the Humanities. Uh, we appreciate all of you showing up. And uh, I'll just start with a, a, a few announcements before turning it over to uh, the introducer uh, and then to our presenter. I just want to note uh, that uh, we have, a, uh, despite the pandemic, a fair number of events uh, this uh, semester and this year. Uh, you can see them all on our website uh, at the, for the Humanities Center, but I'll just note a couple of them. Uh, our next book talk is on October 28th uh, by Christina Lane. It'll be entitled Phantom Lady, Hollywood producer Joan Harrison, The Forgotten Woman Behind Hitchcock. Uh, slightly closer in time, our uh, next uh, uh, Humanities Hour uh, will be on October 13th with Scott Herman, Slavey's Emancipation, a Rashomon Effect. Um, as I said, you can see plenty more events on our website. Um, just a couple of technical things for uh, Q&A. You can uh, type in questions uh, uh, in the Q&A button. Uh, we'll be taking those at the end, but you can type them in at any point. Uh, also, there is a handout. There'll be slides, but if you want some uh, extra, uh, there'll be a handout. Uh, you can find the connection to that in the chat window. Uh, so if you want, you can switch over to that, pull that up. Uh, uh, there'll be a link to our website with the handout. Uh, I know it's a debate tonight, um, and uh, if uh, some of you are masochists like me, uh, you'll probably want to watch uh, some or most of it. Uh, we will try to finish at nine or close to it, uh, but obviously uh, if we run over a little bit, feel free to uh, hit the leave button. We won't be offended uh, and we'll understand the reasons. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Rollins. Uh, Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Philosophy Department to introduce our speaker, Fred Borgard. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Rowlands. I'm the uh, I'm Professor and Chair of the Department of Philosophy. Uh, it's my great pleasure this evening to, to introduce my, my colleague and friend, uh, Britt Brogard. Britt is Professor of Philosophy at, at the University of Miami. Uh, she's also a Cooper Fellow, which is an honor the university bestows only on the most uh, worthy of its citizenry. And uh, almost unique amongst philosophers, she also has her own research lab. She's the director of the, the Brogard Lab for Multisensory Research. Uh, Britt also has uh, various affiliations at other institutions around the world. Uh, she's a professorial fellow at the University of Oslo, Norway. And she's a member of uh, the Network for Sensory Research at the University of Toronto. Uh, Britt is very unusual uh, in that she has uh, not, not one, but, but two PhDs. Um, the first PhD, which she obtained from the University of Copenhagen in, I believe, 1986, is actually in uh, neuroscience. Uh, she followed this up uh, a mere four years later with a PhD in philosophy from the State University of New York in, in Buffalo. So yielding, yielding two PhDs, um, the 90s were presumably quite busy for Britt, but she's kept up this, this level of industry um, ever since. Britt's the author of five books and the editor of 12 further volumes. And she has published, um, to the best of my recollection, I think exactly 150, and, uh, 150 journal articles and book chapters. Uh, Britt's research interests focus uh, squarely on the phenomena of uh, mind and language, but she's almost made, also made important contributions to epistemology, 
That's the area of philosophy concerned with the nature and possibility of knowledge, and also in, in ethics. Throughout her research, she's brought to bear her twin expertise in neuroscience and philosophy in ways that very few others can. Brit is also a public intellectual, equally at home discussing highly technical issues in the metaphysics of propositions, as she is chatting with Morgan Freeman on Through the Wormhole. And in an age that's seen a regrettable retreat of scholarship into the ivory tower, I think this is extremely important and very commendable. Brit's books are, uh, Brit's first book was called Transient Truths. It came out with Oxford University Press in 2012. Uh, On Romantic Love followed, again with o Oxford University Press in 2015. The same year saw the publication of The Superhuman Mind, which was published by the Penguin Group. Seeing and Saying, the, the Language of Perception and the Representational View of Experience came out with Oxford University Press in 2018. Tonight, however, she's going to talk about her, her most recent book, uh, which I believe um, hits the shelves next month. Uh, it's a very timely book, I, I, I think many of you will agree. It's called Hate, Understanding Our Most Dangerous Emotion. Uh, please, give me a, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to uh, Professor Britt Brogard. Okay, I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, so, yeah, so this is my book that is coming out uh, in, at the end of October uh, in, in the US and at the beginning of November in the UK. Um, there's a handout, as, as was mentioned. Um, it doesn't contain exactly the same information um, as, as uh, the slides do. So you might want to uh, just follow along on the slides, but you might want to keep the handout if you're interested in, in the information. Okay, so um, Sorry about that. Um, I think my, my internet is a little unstable. Um, so uh, what, what exactly is, um, is hate is one of the things that I uh, talk about in, uh, in the book. And uh, I begin by, by looking at, at diff some different uh, results from, from Google, uh, Google search than the ones that you see here. But I did another one when I put together these slides. Um, so here's a random sample of Google search results for, um, for the, the phrase, I hate. Um, I'll just go through a couple of them um, to see that uh, hate is, is um, ambiguous or at least uh, has a lot of uh, related meanings. So one, one of these, uh, so these are real examples. I hate my MacBook, it's slow and buggy enough that I wonder if maybe it's a lemon or I hate the fact that the president of the United States is no longer someone parents can point to as a role model for their children. Um, this one was bad. I wish I'd never had my, my kids. I'll always regret them. I hate my life and it's their fault. Um, and I really hate my ex as is normal and so on. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's, um, hate is used in many different uh, senses. So, um, here are some of the senses that it's used in. Uh, so there's a broad sense of hate. It didn't really come out in those examples that you just saw. So here are some other ones, but hate in the broad sense is the kind of sense that we have in mind when we talk about. Britt, I'm sorry to jump in, but uh, I don't think you've um, managed to uh, show your slides yet. Uh, so sorry about that. 
Uh, okay. It, um, yeah, I keep having trouble with it. Um, sorry about that. Maybe it's, maybe it's because it's Google Slides and I should have downloaded it. Yeah, we, we did a practice run and it worked fine. I'm, just, just to let the audience know, but uh, yeah. Okay, I, I got it, I think. I think I got it now. It, it keeps closing the window when I try to do this. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, backtrack uh, one step here. So uh, we don't need, need to look at all of, all of these examples. I just want to mention um, the first two in case we don't have the handout. Uh, so I hate my, my, my MacBook. Um, uh, I hate the fact that uh, the president of the United States and so on. Um, there are many different ways that, that um, or hate has many different meanings in these sentences. And so that was the slide that I, I was at. So there's hate in the broad sense um, where we didn't really see any of, um, of those uh, before in, the, in those examples, but that is the sense of hate that we have in mind when we talk about hate mail, for example, right? So if you send me something that has, or th that, that expresses contempt for me in the mail, then we would still call it hate mail. Um, hate speech is a little more complicated, uh, but, but at least in, in many of these cases, uh, it includes contempt. So that's a broad sense of hate. Um, the narrow sense is what I'm primarily interested in in the book. Uh, I set aside hate of entities. Uh, so those were the examples we were just looking um, at. So laptops, fried liver, or even ideologies, because it's, it's a different kind of attitude um, or mental state. Um, it may, in some cases, be an emotion, and in some cases, it may not. It may be a cognitive attitude but it's definitely a kind of strong dislike. It's very different uh, from the other senses, and so I had to set it aside, even though that would be interesting in and of itself. So personal hate um, is the first part of the book. Um, I talk about two kinds of personal hate, uh, critical hate and dehumanizing hate. If you wanna know some details about that, we can talk about that during Q&A. Uh, and then group hate, where I also talk about um, two senses of group hate. Um, and, and I say that is parasitical on, uh, on uh, personal hate. And then um, collective hate is, uh, is something uh, slightly different uh, because that's, that's not about like, who you hate, but about who the hater is. All right, so... Um, so here's just uh, the content. So um, basically going to focus mostly on chapter seven in this book, though that would be a little bit from chapter five, uh, a teeny bit from chapter eight, but, but uh, one through four is, is personal hate and five through eight is uh, on group hate. Okay, so, um, so let's say a little bit, little bit more about group hate and collective hate. So, so the target of, uh, of, of hate uh, in group hate is, is a social group. Like how exactly to define what a social group is. Um, I go into that in the book. Uh, now I'll just go into, I'm going to leave it just intu intuitive for you to um, think about as, as a social group. For example, it could be um, ethnic group, um, but I also think there could be other social groups that are not uh, necessarily marginalized groups. Um, Collective hate, as I said, is, is different because it's not about who you hate, um, but about the hater. So the hater is a group. Now, all of these, of course, can come apart. So a group can hate an individual person, right? Uh, and um, an individual can hate a, a group of people, right? So you might, you might uh, or someone might 
hate w women uh, as an individual, right? That doesn't mean that they're that they're part of a group that of haters, even though there are uh, such a thing as misogynists, but they don't form, um, presumably form a group that's that's very inter has in interesting features, except for that they have that in common. Um, collective hate is a difficult attitude uh, to account for because it involves um, a joint attitude and there's a lot of uh, people trying to figure out what that, uh, that is and I've, I'm uh, following, well, I'm actually deviating a, a bit from the literature in how uh, I'm accounting for that. Um, I take uh, collective hate to involve an implicit, or well, it could be explicit, of course, but at least an implicit agree, uh, commitment to, ha to, to hatred or, or to acting as if you hate. And that's because um, hate is uh, fundamentally an emotion, but you can't, even though you can cultivate emotions or something like that, you can't really sort of just choose to be, to hate or choose to not hate or, so, um, so presumably to be a member, um, a, good, a member in good standing of a hate group, um, you, would just have to act as if you hate. Um, and that's also something we're very used to. Um, so when, if you're married and you got married in a traditional way, um, the, the wedding vows, the traditional wedding vows, they, they uh, involve a clause about promising to love you till death do us apart. But even if it doesn't, <laughs> your marriage doesn't last that long, you might lose the love uh, sooner than you can actually get a divorce. And if that happens, then what is going on with your promise? Well, what's going on, of course, is you're not promising something about an emotion you can't control. You're going to, again, promise, uh, I'm going to act as if, at least until we end the relationship or we die. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about here to stay within uh, the timeliness. Uh, it was, again, as I said, uh, mostly from chapter um, chapter seven. So chapter seven uh, looks at, it specifically looks at white supremacy, but so, that, so, uh, so this is also um, reflected here, but some of the other forms of group hate are um, covered in chapters five and six of the book, like misogyny in, in chapter six. Uh, so, so what uh, escalates um, group hatred? Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that, that is, has, has escalated it? So st statistically, um, we know that, that there's an increase in, in uh, group hates um, within the, the last 10 years, for example. Um, and projections indicate that there will be a further increase uh, the next, in the next uh, decade. So one factor is uh, romanticizing um, the past. Um, I put in parentheses the white supremacist past because our past uh, here and, and, and in many places in Europe as well uh, was a white supremacist past. Um, so when we romanticize the past, um, what we are romanticizing is also a white supremacist past, right? It's not uh, by itself a reason to to become a hater, I think, um, but it's it's definitely um, a factor, right? A factor in in convincing people that a time in the past was better, which happens to be a white supremacist time or past, All right? So make America great again, is just like an example of, um, of romanticizing uh, the past in that way, right? Otherwise, when was it great? Was it ever great? Um, so anyway, so so in the book, uh, which I won't have time to hear, I built it. Up, I built um, up an ideology based on on this idea of of romanticizing the past, the white supremacist past, which I call the American fantasy with P H. Um, 
it's roughly this. Uh, this is a summary anyway. So, um, move this a little bit over here. Okay. Um, so it's basically the the, the self-serving delusion that America once was and once again can become an idyllic nation of white people for whom upward mobility is the rule rather than the exception, where traditional gender norms prevail and where white people dominate non-whites or live without them entirely. So I call it that the American fantasy. Uh, so I developed uh, some, some reasons for that uh, in chapter seven, uh, but now I can't actually, um, I can't. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, something is wrong with the slides again. Um, here. Stop sharing. Let me just stop for a second and see if I can figure out what's wrong. Oh, wait. Oh, no, it works. Is this shared? Uh, no, it's not shared, right? Uh, no, it's, it's not shared yet. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why it's. Um, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to see if it works now. I think it works now. No, wait. Uh, Uh, okay. Um, give me two, give me two minutes. Um, I I think it it's. I don't know what what happened to it. Um, Okay, let me let me try now. Yeah, it works. It's here again. Okay, great. So I just have to get it in view mode. Hopefully, it will work. Then. Okay. So, yeah, so, so let's just go over this first. So I use the pH spelling um, sort of for two reasons. Uh, that's like a nice uh, word in, um, in psychiatry that, uh, that is spelled with pH, uh, goes back to some sort of Freudian um, psychi uh, psychiatry or theory uh, where it roughly um, refers to some un um, imaginative fulfillment of some frustrated conscious or unconscious wishes. So that was one reason I, I used it with pH and then um, the standard uh, satirical effect. All right, so that, that, that's sort of um, one, one phenomenon. Um, another phenomenon, um, and we'll, we'll see how some of these come together, uh, is group polarization. Group polarization is an interesting phenomenon, which um, is not following, um, what you would predict from, I mean, the initial models of how groups ought to work, group polarization violated those. And that's basically that you can go into a group with a moderate uh, viewpoint. So say that you, you hate a certain ethnic group uh, and you go into um, um, a bigger group and you have a conversation with a bigger group um, and they all have the same um, hatred towards the same ethnic group. 
um, but it's a fairly moderate uh, form of hatred for all the members. Um, after the conversation, of course, there's different studies showing how long that conversation has to be and so on. Um, you actually will end up, every member or most members will end up with more extreme positions that, than they entered with. Uh, so that's a phenomenon of group polarization, which is different from uh, attitude polarization, which just is like that you get more radicalized. But here is actually that there's no group member such that that group member was more radical than anyone in the group at the end of the discussions or the debate. Um, and that uh, plays a lot of, uh, has played a huge role in, uh, in rad uh, radicalizing uh, some people who have committed hate crimes uh, online. Um, the, clearly the initial condition for a group polarization um, is that it has to be a group of like-minded individuals, um, or it could be individuals committed to a joint cause, as long as it's something that they're very passionate about. Um, and this is some, so, so uh, Cass uh, Sunstein, um, if you're aware of, who is, uh, uh, she predicted in the 80s or right after the birth of the internet that, um, that with the internet, um, we would have more hatred uh, because on the internet, um, the internet facilitates the formation of groups of people that are similar minded, or very passionate about some joint costs. And because it facilitates that, so it's a lot more, it's a lot harder to find similar groups of similar minded individuals in your local community. It's not impossible, of course, as we have seen like, like um, the KKK and so on, but, but it's clearly is, is easier to do it. And there's a lot of other factors too, such that, that you can be, you can, for example, you can be anonymous and so on. Um, so that, that's definitely a factor. I'm gonna, uh, if time allows, I'm gonna return to, uh, if you're good, um, on, on to that later. Um, propaganda, propaganda is, is, is really, um, it is strictly speaking, um, it's so broadly defined that it includes regular like commercials or advertisements. Uh, so speech that's used for the purpose of manipulating public opinion. So. Uh, we have to admit that at least most uh, commercials, say on television, uh, are used, right, with the purpose of manipulating public opinion. But uh, so, so, so it's not just propaganda, of course, but political propaganda. Um, and speech here is, is actually sort of a, a technical term. It's sort of, uh, I talked to my colleague, uh, Alex from, from English, and, and it's sort of like the, the equivalent of, the, of text in English, which apparently can also be verbal, so, so we use speech to mean something that can also be written or a movie or something like that. Okay, so here uh, is, is an example. So this is um, an example of propaganda. It's, uh, it's not your typical propaganda. So when we, th when we talk about political propaganda, it, we often think about um, <clears throat> maybe Second World War, uh, leading up to Second World War, uh, so Nazi Germany and some of the posters, for example, that, that they were featuring, right? But, but here's, um, here's a novel, right? It's not advertised as, as hate literature. So, so you might accidentally pick it up. I actually had to pick it up, but uh, because I had to use some quotes from it. Um, but we could also accidentally pick it up. So uh, this is where Camus is a French writer. Um, I picked up the translation, of course. Uh, so Camus was uh, coined the, the, the term genocide uh, by substitution, uh, which is sort of, um, it's a way of, of using um, the victims, really the victims, uh, what's going on uh, when, when, when people are victims, like say gen like genocides when you have like the Holocaust, right? Um, you're turning that around and saying, oh, but we white people, we're being substituted by non-white people. So that's that's the that's the term he coined there, in in um, in this novel. Um, so the novel is is um, is about some immigrants um, coming coming into to actually to Europe and and, and France, um, and uh, some of the quotes are are a little hard to to stomach. Uh, so. 
so some of the examples these are that's why i had to take uh, get get the book because um I, I, this one I got partially from uh, NPR, but then I I, um, I got the book and I couldn't find it, and and it turned out that it was actually misquoted. So I, so I had to uh, I know I had to find a couple of others. So kinky haired, swarthy skins, long uh, despised phantoms uh, is one. Uh, teeming ants toiling for the um, wealthy man's uh, white man's comfort, um, and then you can read that for yourself. Um, now it has, um, it was inspired by a, a, a somewhat um, earlier book, Camp, uh, The Camp of the Saints. Um, and um, and that book, The Camp of the Saints, that's inspired um, Camus' book, uh, was uh, the, the, the one that seems to have motivated um, the, the shootings Christchurch, New Zealand shootings. Um, he had a manifesto that was called The Great Replacement. So that was the, the title of Camus' book. Um, it also seems to, uh, to mention just one other example, it seems to have also motivated uh, the uh, Walmart El Paso, Texas shooting, um, where at least that was, um, that was evidence that that book inspired um, inspired the the shooter um, to do what he did. So these are just two examples. I actually have some other examples as well. So the book uh, is we can, we can definitely say it's influential, um, not in a good way, obviously. Um, so um, now genocide by substitution, unlike genocides, uh, is of course a conspiracy theory, right? Because there isn't such a thing as genocide by substitution, right? The white people are not being uh, killed of by substituting us for 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 non-white people. So it's, it's conspiracy theory, right? But it's not on the fringes. Um, in fact, um, Camus' ideas have had quite, um, well, both authors' ideas have had quite um, a lot of influence on on the current uh, government's immigration policies. So, so Stephen Miller, for example, um, was promoting the book, and this is just what there's evidence for. Uh, presumably, um, there's only evidence from 15 and 16, but but we can only guess that it's been promoted a lot more. So. So these books that we just talked about that motivated those uh, shootings and that um, um, describe immigrants as as ants, for example, um, they are being promoted by um, senior house advisor Stephen Miller. Um, so that's so, so, so that's scary. Um, I want to say a bit more. Um, so some, sometimes the, the boundaries get a little blurry, but that is a concept that I call hate implicature. And hate implicature is is just a special form of implicature in Paul Grice's sense. I can give you a quick example. So she is out of gas. Um, so she's asking someone, uh, well, do you know where I can get some gas? And this person says, well, there's a uh, gas station around the corner. Um, and so the implicature in this case is, is, is not actually set, right? So there's a gas station around the corner, um, but it's, it's the implicature of what's implied. It's another way to put the same thing. What you can read between the lines is a more colloquial way of saying the same thing, is that there's a gas station around the corner that is open and has gas. Um, if if it didn't, right? If the person, especially if the person knew, I mean, if the person intentionally said that there's a gas station around the the corner and laughing inside him, himself uh, because he knew that it was closed down, uh, then that would be a, a violation of conversational norms. So hate implicatures um, follow uh, to rise the sense. So that that's a lot of really interesting cases. But I thought I would pick some um, some cases that were easy to put on slides. Uh, so. Basically, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it has hate, I mean, it's some rising implicature, right? 
that's intended. So it's a strategic discourse that's used to produce it. Um, the notion of, of latent strategic discourse is actually um, from Habermas. Uh, so, so, um, so I've used that with, with, with combined that with Grice to, to get to this. And then, so here's some easy, very simple examples, some of the much more trickier ex examples that I consider in, in chapter eight of the book. Um, <clears throat> But there's blame on, on both sides, very fine people on both sides, right? Uh, so, so this is a, we, we, most people, uh, most of us are familiar with this one, but it's also a good illustration because uh, if you read it word for word, um, maybe the, the very fine people is, 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 is not, if, if you just took the first part, there's blame on both sides. Um, you know, you have to sort of read more into it um, in order to, uh, see that it's a hateful statement and that it's a strategically hateful. Of course, that's something that we can only infer from observing a person's behavior over time where um, we can't usually in just infer in people's intentions, but we know that it was, it was intentional or strategic. And it's clearly latent, right? It's latent enough that he's not coming out directly and saying, oh, yay for the white supremacists. Um, um, so here, here's another uh, one. Well, actually, it, 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 uh, the rally, of course, is bad enough um, that a rally is a rally. But I, what I'm referring to here as um, as as a as a hate implicature is uh, his refusal at um, the first presidential, maybe the only presidential um, debate where where he. Asked, was asked again and again and was refusing or pretending to like answering another question instead of that what was asked or pretending to not know the proud uh, proud boys and so on um that that's also clearly strategic and also clearly hateful um it's latent so that's the rising part of it uh there's a there's a lot there a lot more trick that tricky examples uh, that take a lot more analysis, so I've not included those here. Um, clearly, uh, the dark triad of personality, it includes uh, narcissism, psychopathy, so that's the psychopath, and then something called Machiavellianism, which Machiavellianism is, um, is specifically uh, um, a person who is specifically trying to deceive people. You, of course, can have uh, all three traits or overlaps. Um, so, a very, so a person who is like mostly just deceitful, lying, um, maybe pretending to be a doctor and, and getting a job as a doctor, uh, the famous examples of that, of Machiavellian people. Um, uh, psychopathy is, 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 of course, we think serial killer, but in the dark triad of personality, uh, it's actually meant to be in the, in, within the sort of the normal population. So the places we would look for psychopathy is like in top leadership positions. So that could be like presidency, probably. Um, the president of a university, the dean of a university, maybe even the chair of the de uh, department, you know, who knows? Not, not our chair, of course. Um, so, but narcissism, um, psychopathy and Machiavellianism, uh, they are put in that triangle because they actually do share many um, traits. Um, and so, so they have an overlap. Um, and again, these are not clinical constructs, but sort of constructs in the, uh, sort of at the extreme of the normal population. Okay, recruitment tactics uh, for the youth, uh, that goes way back. Here's two examples from, uh, from 1935 from um, a high school math book in Germany. Uh, that was, um, you don't have to read the whole thing obviously, but you can see that uh, the problem it outlines is, is, is probably uh, uh, a problem that's at the level of, of the high school class that uh, the, where the book was used. But you can see that the focus of the, the problem is on, on gas bombs, um, Berlin, and so on, right? So, so here um, you have something like indoctrination through the school books. Uh, that, that, so that was 1935. Here's another problem in, from, from the same book. Um, 
so in this case, uh, again, it's about like poison uh, gassing. How, how much would you need to gas a, a certain number of uh, inhabitants? So, so they, they so they get fed this sort of. They might not even like be thinking about so much about the wording, right? But it's it's still it's still being taken in by the mind. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to to also return to all of this. Uh, here's a, here's something about children. This is from 1979. It's a, it was a checklist that helped parents in 1979 decide whether their kids were ready for kindergarten. And one of the questions that it included uh, was, can he, so it's only children, children are only four, so apparently, or were, uh, can he travel alone in the neighborhood uh, four to eight blocks to store, school, playground, or to a friend's home? Um, why is that interesting? Well, because kindergarten, they might be five years old, six years old, um, right? So, so here we had so the the so the the so these kids uh, who were roaming around freely here, they were uh, the the Gen Xers, um, right? So the Gen Xers were roaming around, and then um, the Gen Xers reacted um, according to standard psychological principles. Uh, and became a uh, helicopter, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing obviously to get through this, uh, helicopter parents, so the same Gen X uh, who were free ranging as kids became helicopter parents. Um, and so, so the increase in helicopter parents uh, uh, clearly is, seems to be a reflection of, of that. Or it, it hasn't been obviously, the connection hasn't been established except as a correlation, um, but why is that interesting? Well, because these Gen Xs, they got, uh, they had Gen Y kits, or well, some of them had Gen Setters, but we, we don't have that many uh, statistics. Actually, some of them have probably have Gen Alphas, but we don't have that much statistics about those yet. So I'll focus on the Ys. The Ys, there's a lot of statistics, and it turns out that because of the helicoptering um, being, um, uh, they, they, they're very, um, they, have, they tend to have a, person, uh, a narcissistic personality to a much greater degree than previous generations at the same age. Um, and uh, even studies that, that look at uh, the older, or excuse me, the older generation Y, they had much less narcissistic than, um, than the, than, than the uh, generation Y just before it switched to gen, generation Z, right? So where we don't have data. So, uh, so, so it seems to suggest that the younger you are, well, while still being a, an adult, um, the more um, narcissistic you are, but also you're more narcissistic than say your parents were, um, were on average at the same age. Um, but it's a vulnerable dark uh, triad though that they fall into. So it's vulnerable narcissism. They have an extreme, um, inclination or disposition towards uh, hypersensitivity and they are not the the grandiose narcissists that you normally see they are very sensitive to criticism but they are also uh, still very uh, very narcissistic but they are introverts so they may not um, necessarily um, be spotted as such um, so just uh, stick to that one um now the sorry so 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 the um the recruitment on campuses uh is something that we know takes place um and so we know that they are successful as well in some cases so that leaves the question uh that i then attempt to answer in chapter seven um among many other questions, and that is why we're joining a hate group, let alone a militaristic hate group. Why would that quench their thirst for for approval? Um, and I consider a, a few things. Uh, that's what Hitler called blood cement. Um, it's a kind of um, 
it's not this your standard kind of group dynamic. It's a kind of collective guilt that's so collective that no one bears the responsibility individually, very conveniently. And um, only have a few more slides to go. Um, so, as a, as a, another another reason um, that and, and and actually this is something that the empirical studies of that hate actually has uh, is addictive. Uh, it actually releases much um, of a dopamine rush uh, as the good times of being in love. Um, so, but unlike. Unlike the uh, being in love, it 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 it, it can hate, it can last a lot longer. So it's it's like like sort of the ideal drug if, if you want the dopamine rush for a long time, not if you uh, want to be a good person. Okay. So that that was it. But let me let me just say uh, just like to to, to summarize, um, there are a number of, of of factors, of course, that 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 play a role here. But there's one that I I I left out because for time reasons that. Uh, would have taken like an hour, I think, to to explain properly, and that is uh, economic uh, inequality. Uh, the, very a lot of interesting studies of how that escalates hatred. So, this, so these factors I I presented are not the only ones. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thanks very much, Britt, and uh, we'll turn to the question portion of the program. Um, and I'll just remind people that uh, to ask a question, you can uh, type into the Q&A. Uh, and the first question we have is, um, it says, thanks for the time, such a timely book. Do you say anything there about how we might diffuse or otherwise cope with the forms of hate you discuss? Or might we derive any strategies for this from what you say? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so most of, uh, of my last chapter, the chapter eight is, is about that. Um, I focus on a philosophical problem uh, and that is a problem of how to legislate hate speech in a way that, uh, that, 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 that works, doesn't work always in, in Europe. Um, and so, so, so legislating hate speech in the right way uh, might be one factor, but I have a lot of other factors. One one thing that we learn from group polarization is that uh, similar-minded groups of people um, that is what may foster hatred, uh, right? So, so the things you can do, you can, you can take the the very different-minded people uh, and I'm sorry, the very similar-minded people and and make them interested in another, or be passionate about another joint cause, or you could try to cultivate um, something that exists already in many cities, uh, Civic Saturdays, that try to bring like people from, from all trades together and debate, and that actually does not give rise to, to group polarization. There's also uh, voting systems um, there's, uh, that, that are different from our own. Uh, there's something called ranked choice voting, uh, and then there's a system that I'm developing with a psychologist in Denmark um, uh, that, that uh, we, we call it sort of, for fun, yay or nay voting. But it means that if you, if you, if we, if we were in existence right now, you could go and uh, use your, your, your vote either to vote for Biden or against Trump. So you have that, you have one vote, but you could use it either for or against. Um, but we, we are still processing that. Um, these other systems have the advantage uh, that uh, ranked choice voting is just like assigning, say, one, two, three, four, five to five candidates. But it has the advantage that you might win as a politician by having a lot of second choice votes or third choice votes, right? And so you can't just cater to your base and you can't just uh, be really adversarial towards your opponent. Uh, so in that way, you would actually, it would help in terms of the political climate. Um, yeah, so those are, are I, I, I have I mentioned a few others, but I, but again, I focus mostly on the hate speech uh, legislation, but good question. Uh, thanks. Uh, and for the next question, um, uh, it's the, it's, there's no question that hate has a huge level, a huge negative impact 
both at the individual and the societal levels. I wonder whether there are also positive sides to hate as well. Presumably the hate for Nazis played an important role in resisting their appalling actions in World War II. More generally, are emotions crucially context dependent and have different impacts and polarities, as it were, in, di in distinct contexts? Question from another philosopher, as you might guess. <laughs> yeah, I could kind of guess that. <laughs> it, of course, it's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, and that's actually really interesting um, how it can work in the same way as outrage uh, can work in terms of, of uh, protesting. Um, so if you felt hatred, uh, to, like when you see a police officer strangling a, a black man and you feel hatred rather than your outrage, well, maybe that's a good thing. At least that made me, at the height of the coronavirus cases in Miami, go to um, to the protests here in Miami. So, 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 it did lead to to that good thing. But um, uh, yeah, I think that at the personal level too, it can have um, it can have a healing effect. So, it's as I'm comparing it with grief. So there, so the grief is not always. Um, maybe the only, as, as it's normally defined, the only um, complex emotion that, that you should feel uh, in adverse circumstances when you lose something. So suppose that uh, someone murders um, one of your loved ones uh, and yeah, you should grieve the, 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 the loved one, but for healing purposes, um, you should actually also hate, but it's not any form of hate that will work. Um, and so I go a bit into that in the first part of the book about the difference between dehumanizing and critical hate. And um, dehumanizing hate is actually not, it doesn't have a healing effect. But it's interesting also in the sense of hatred, in the sense of resistance. Um, I don't discuss that a, a little bit, I discuss a little bit, but not uh, sufficiently. But um, yeah, so it does have I would say in both cases, it's hatred at the individual level. So even if you go to a protest to resist something, um, it's still at, you still go as an individual, right? It's not that you know you're not going there. So the whole group is not a social group or something. Okay. Um, another question is: Is there a relationship between hate and disgust? And if so, what might that be? Oh, that's interesting. From another philosopher, I bet. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, that is an, uh, that is an, um, a direct relationship between, it's, as, I, as I lay it out, as a direct relationship between uh, contempt uh, and disgust, because I, I take contempt to involve, um, it's on the handout, but not on, on the slides, but it's, I take contempt to involve disgust uh, plus. Uh, blame and plus is directed at the person's character traits. Uh, and so in the, in the broad sense of hate, that would include contempt. Clearly that's a, that's a link. Um, now, can you also, um, is a link also between hatred in the narrow sense um, and disgust? And I think that that is because at least, it's hard to explain philosophically why, but at least empirically, it's well established that people um, move from hatred to contempt and back, back and forth. Uh, and and so, so there's a lot of studies of that, but if you can move from hatred and, in a narrow sense and contempt, which is uh, just a species of disgust, the ways to think about it, uh, then, then yeah, that must be a connection, but, um, but right now it's hard to see what the connection is. Um, Except, except that it's there, it's, it's, it's like empirically verified, but it's, it's not, um, that's not a philosophical explanation that I can think of, uh, except that, it, of course, it has many, co many components that are overlapping between hate, hatred and contempt. So maybe you, that's why you slide back and forth, I don't know. Um, but that doesn't answer the question directly about discuss, except empirically. Okay, I'm going to throw a couple of questions together and then maybe add one of my own that's an offshoot of them. Um, one says, great presentation, obsession might be the key to psychopathy. Um, my question is, why do intellectuals approve of hate groups such as Antifa? Is that because it is counter hegemonic? Are there good hates? Uh, the next question is, 
Uh, this week in Miami, high school students from many different schools displayed a great amount of hatred while publicly protesting abortion rights. Start as an extra credit assignment. Um, how is religion playing a role in modern societies? And what I'd add is, you know, we're obviously dealing with very uh, polarized uh, situation. And so uh, a question is, you know, is, uh, uh, what makes Proper Boys a hate group or not, depending on your point of view, uh, what makes Antifa a hate group or not, uh, uh, you know, on dealing with issues like abortion, um, uh, you know, is that the same as dealing with um, uh, attacking groups? Um, then, of course, there's also the issues yeah. of uh, religion and obsession. So there's lots of things in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. It's uh, uh, so very good questions, too. And uh, um, again, it's a good, good hate. Well, yes, there, there can be good hate because it's either healing or it's, or it's, 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 an, um, it's a way uh, for you to uh, perhaps uh, make a change to society. Um, and try to achieve uh, social justice. Uh, so, so that was what I mentioned before. So adding to this, no. So it, you can't just say that if that every hate group is a bad hate group, right? Because um, if you have uh, a, a group that happens to have hatred and not merely outrage, but critical, what I call critical hatred, um, and they and they formed a protest together, or they formed the group together. Um, presumably, you would have to extend our our um, what the point we we made about an individual who is using it for social change. So, if a group is is achieving social change, so that's a goal. But one thing that's important, I think, is that um, retaliation, or if you want um, uh, vindictiveness. Um, uh, and, and even desires uh, in that direction are, are extremely, uh, not, o not only immoral, but so speaking as a philosopher, I actually have an argument for that, that even um, retaliatory desires are immoral, but they are also unhealthy, so they're also not prudential in the sense that it's not in your own self-interest. Um, so, so it can't be retaliatory hatred and it can't be dehumanizing hatred. Those that cannot be good forms of hatred, um, um, the dehumanizing might be almost almost self-explanatory. Um, the, the, the retaliatory desires, even if you don't act on them, it takes a little bit more of an argument to make that point. But um, I can make it for retaliation itself. And I can say that if your hatred is the kind of hatred that, um, that might make you retaliate, you can you then actually uh, using another person uh, merely as a tool for the satisfaction of your own interests. And what's your own interest? Well, satisfying your retaliatory desires. Um, maybe that went over a little quickly, but basically it's that you can't use another, another person as, as a tool or as a means, um, as a mere means to an end. And so, so that's a way to, to rule those cases out but you can have hatred that um, that is perfectly justified. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's the group level hatred is like, you have to be a little fanciful to come up with cases like where, where that's justified. Okay, I think we'll finish with one last question. Um, if young people are desperate for approval, why seek out hate groups over other groups that are founded on more positive emotions? Yeah, so of course, uh, given the, the, the time limit on the presentation, I didn't present the statistics. And so it's not that uh, the majority of attention seeking uh, or approval seeking young people um, who perhaps have had uh, helicopter parents, that they become members of hate groups. Uh, it's that the number of recruits at that age uh, is, is increasing. And so it's a theoretical explanation. Uh, so, so no one has been around with, with, a, with a form asking these kids if, if that was why they, they, they did this. But that, I mean, so there's these theories about, the there are measurements 
of their increased narcissism compared to earlier generations, and that it's this vulnerable narcissism, so that they're also very super sensitive, hypersensitive. And there's also evidence that more, um, more kids that age join uh, hate groups. But maybe, for all we know, the hate, the hate groups are just becoming more t trigger in finding ways to recruit them. We don't know. But and, and anyway, so this is uh, um, obviously um, not something you can sort of empirically measure. So it's, it's more of an argument. Theory. Right. Well, there some more good questions have come in, but uh, we're at the end of the hour. Uh, and so regretfully, I think we'll have to uh, shut down here. Uh, but thank you very much for an interesting talk and thanks to everybody for attending and for sending in good questions and we hope to see you at future events. So thanks very much and have a good evening.